Okay, greetings all. Welcome back to a long delay Q&A session where I get to answer the questions posed to me by you guys. Well, at least some of you guys. Uh, those who meet the Patreon threshold pretty much get a guaranteed response, but I do take occasional additional questions from other sources like Facebook or YouTube if I think that they're interesting enough. So, of course, I will start with the elephant. At this time of recording, Russia is engaged in a war against Ukraine. Like everyone else, I have initial opinions as to what I am seeing. However, unlike a lot of the other military history folks, it seems, I am not issuing pronouncements of my opinions and interpretations. There are folks out there who are paid full time to be analysts of current military events. They would be your best people to listen to, because I have other jobs. Personally, since I have made something of a reputation for myself of making researched statements, or at least well-grounded opinions, I think that we being in the middle of a war, uh, where at the very least there is a bias on the information coming out, if not downright propaganda, combined with tiny video snippets absent background information, uh, this isn't the best time to be assessing what is happening. This is a major conflict, it will be studied for many years to come, and it will take some time for well-resourced histories to start to be published in unclassified channels, probably also first researched in Russian and Ukrainian and then translated in English, or declassified from NATO or EU channels. And those will be the majority basis of factual assessments and what I am probably going to end up using before making most of my own declarations or opinions. No, don't get me wrong, I'm watching every snippet with as much interest as you are. But face it, what have we seen? A whole bunch of destroyed vehicles and a few aircraft shootdowns. Have we seen a single anti-armor engagement either by vehicle or man portable? The closest I've seen is an end law to the side of a tank, which I'm not sure wasn't already abandoned to begin with. So, for the next while, don't ask me much about the Ukraine war. I don't think I'm in a position to provide answers of the quality that I feel comfortable giving. If more information or videos come out where I do feel I have some context and make a useful statement, well then I'll review that position. Especially since, apparently, uh, the Russians are just being really weird in their actions and I'm not sure how much of a conclusion you can take away from this anyway. So. To the questions, and kicking off with Admiral Tiberius. It is often noted how bad Italian tanks were. They had less than ideal armor, guns, etc. But what was the quality and training level of Italian crews? Tick states in his Operation Crusader video that Italians on the whole fought well in the defense, but got generally dismissed and ignored in official histories by both Germans and the British. On this, Tick's not far off base. Now, I have a personal theory that the Germans preferred to place any blame for their losses on those weak Italians because it was easier to accept than that they had been defeated themselves. And when the British got defeated, it was much easier to blame those superior Germans than to accept that, gasp, the Italians might have beaten them. This applies to the US as well. I'll say that most people who know of Catherine Pass don't know that the Italians were present. They went up against the Germans and got their arses kicked, right? Now, that's also an example where Tick's statement can be a little bit misleading. Catherine Pass was not a defensive engagement by the Italians, and of those who knew that the Italians were present, I bet even fewer knew that after a couple of days of fighting, it was the 5th Bersaglieri Regiment under Colonel Bonfatti, who was killed in the attack, that was instrumental in breaking the American line, receiving specific praise from the German commander Belouius. Now, as a counterpoint, the initial British offensive in the Western Desert, Operation Compass, was against Italians in the defense, and the end result was the loss of nearly 150,000 Italians at the cost of about 2,000 British killed and wounded. Obviously, the Italians did not cover themselves with glory in the defense there. The causes of the lack of Italian successes are varied, and I'm not going to get into them here, but the operative was not so much what they were doing, attack or defense, as much as who they were. Artillery and Bersaglieri in particular were competent both in attack and defense. 
black shirt units or maybe common infantry were of a far more questionable utility in either attack or defense. Now, when it comes to the armor crews, the best I've seen in English is Ian Walker's Iron Hulls, Iron Hearts which traces the combat history of the three Italian armored divisions. These units were generally courageous and competent, but decidedly limited by their equipment and a few hindrances from above. It's about 200 pages, so a fairly light read. To quote from his conclusion, How do we rate the performance of the Italian armored divisions? They were clearly very different formations from those Italian divisions beaten and written off by the British back in 1940-41. They were better trained and equipped than the Italian infantry formations and, more importantly, more suited to the needs of mobile warfare. They were never a match for British armoured divisions either in size or equipment, but they could and did meet British armoured brigades on almost equal terms. The myth of Italian military failure originated in the opening phase of the war when Italian forces collapsed on the Greek and British attack. Many nations had to learn from their initial encounters. The Italians also learned from their early failures and managed to stem the routes in Albania and North Africa, a fact ignored by those who prefer to attribute this to German intervention. The effective operations of Italian armored divisions in North Africa themselves indicate how much Italian performance improved since 1940 to 41. Now, of course, there's only so much you can do when you're facing up against Shermans with two inches of well-soaked armor and a 75 millimeter gun, when you've got a bolted, nearly vertical one inch plate and a 47 millimeter, as the Italians found out when they engaged the US Army on the western side of Kasserine Pass. Still, you have to admire the courage for doing it. Jay. Is it actually procedure to make the loader get out, possibly a gunpoint, to check for dangerous seaburn conditions if there isn't another way to check? Or is that just a joke? No joke. The unmasking procedures are outlined in FM 17-15 Tank Platoon and it is publicly available online. Yeah, think about it. You have this little chemical detector kit, the M256. It's this really cheap looking thing. You break a capsule, you wave it around a bit, and then you look to see what it tells you about the presence of agents or you use a bit of M8 chemical detector paper. Just how much do you trust it so that you're gonna have everybody pull off their masks at once? Then, ask the question, who is going to volunteer to be the first to pull off the mask? I personally doubt there will be many volunteers. The manual states, the senior person should select one or two soldiers to start the unmasking procedures. Now, it's fairly dry and cold, but think about what that entails. He needs to designate somebody as least mission essential. Not necessarily in the most junior ranking, but the person that the unit can most afford to lose. Okay, I guess there's an argument about the second lieutenant, but still. Then he has to trust that this person, who has now just been mortally insulted, literally, will happily go along with the idea of pulling his mask off and potentially exposing himself to a horrible nerve agent death just because he was ordered to. Oh, and that person also has a gun. The least mission essential person in a tank unit is probably going to be a loader. That is also the person who a tank commander can most easily control from his position because there's lots of open space behind the breach. Finally, he's probably the least likely person in the tank to have actually read FM 17-15. So there's a lesson here, lads. Read your manuals. Thus, the safest way of doing business is for the commander to draw a sidearm, aim it at the loader, and say, loader, give me a weapon. Then the loader is instructed to hold his breath, break the seal on the mask for 15 seconds, and keep his eyes open. Then he is monitored, as you know, presumably the TC has the antidote injectors handy. And if you haven't seen these things, they're like spring-loaded needles yet. Once they hit your thigh, they immediately inject. It's kind of very impressive, but also kind of off-putting. Then again, the, the nasal pharyngeal tube, the, the nose hose, that, that, that's, ugh. oh God, you can see that in a live demonstration. But anyway, this is all part of a process which is taught to all soldiers in basic training, at least in the US. Not, not the give me a weapon bit, but the whole break the mask, have your antidotes ready. The next step is break the seal, take a few breaths, reseal. 
And then finally you unmask completely for 5 minutes and then remask. If all is still good for 10 minutes after that, then it is considered safe enough for everyone else to unmask. So yes, it sounds a little bit cruel, but is there a better way of doing it? It is a bit of a shock the first time for the loader though, when it happens to them in training. NBC drills don't happen so often that there isn't always a new guy who doesn't have the heads up as to what's coming. Josh Conti. From the Cold War and into modern warfare, anti-tank guns have largely fallen out of favor. But the Soviets were still designing and using and selling anti-tank guns. For how long did this go on? Quite a while. I believe they are technically still available for production in Ukraine. Uh, the obvious problem with a post-war towed anti-tank gun is that they are win or die weapons. They are way too big to be easily maneuvered and if you don't kill everything you can see quickly you are going to be a sitting duck for the rest. Now for this I'm not looking at things like recoilless rifles which are a slightly different kettle of fish. I'm looking at basically a tank cannon on a towed mount. The US developed 90mm and even 105mm towed guns, but outside of some combat trials with the 90mm as part of the Zebra mission at the end of the war, uh, the same mission that the Pershings went on, uh, the US decided to go away from that line of thinking. The Soviets however kept the faith with T-12 entering service in 1961. However, this was no ordinary 100mm gun. In order to boost penetration, they made it a smooth bore. T-55's gun, 100mm, would lob an APCBC round at a little over 900 meters a second. That's 3,000 feet a second for us Yanks. A T-12's round would go at 1,500 meters a second, or about 5,000 feet a second. So this is no mean gun when it comes to penetration, and the success of T-12 led directly to the selection of the smoothbore 115mm for T-62. Now combine that with rate of fire. A tow missile takes over 6 seconds to fly 1200 meters and then there's a fairly lengthy reload. A T-12 would have a good chance of destroying two centurions at that distance in that same amount of time. At longer distances the advantage to the gun is even higher until you get to the point where the gun's accuracy starts to fall off. So that's probably why the Soviets kept with it. It's not a concept without any merit at all. The improved version, the T-12A or Rapira, showed up in 1970. However, there was some concern that the new generation of MBTs, notably Chieftain, might be too tough for the T-12s, so an even bigger version was planned, Sprut, using the same 125mm ammunition as the guns found on the Soviet tanks of the time. However, in this case they came up with a way of maybe making the gun just a little bit more survivable. The gun is mounted on a variant of the D30 howitzer's trail, but with a small little auxiliary motor, able to drive the gun along flat surfaces at over 10 km an hour. Thus, after you fire a few rounds, you don't have to go through the hassle of reversing a towing vehicle into the exposed gun position in order to get away. However, it still takes 2 or 3 minutes to fold up the trail and lower the wheels before the auxiliary motor can scoot the gun out of sight, which means that although at least egress is a lot faster, you're still going to have to hope you kill most everything before it's time to leave. However, the advantages of concealability are reduced in the modern world where exposed crewmen will be a beacon in a thermal imaging site so that even a reduced to two minutes to leave is probably still unacceptable. Hence the preference today of the use of mounting guns in armored vehicles like TDs or tanks, which also have the advantage of being far more resistant to things like mortars or near misses by HE rounds. S-Face! You get the ability to send the manufacturing package of an armored vehicle to the Allies in World War I. Keeping in mind the technology and manufacturing capabilities of that time, which vehicle would you choose and why? This extremely silly scenario reminds me somewhat of Eric Flint's 1632, where a West Virginia town realizes it needs to sort of technology downwards in order to survive in a time before modern resources are available. So going back to World War I isn't all that difficult, as long as one avoids anything involving electronics. Not electrics, they have motors and all, just electronics. 
That basically means anything up to the 1960s or so is not beyond capability. Um, okay, sure, the metallurgy of the time probably wouldn't permit a D10 exactly to go onto a T55 or a Centurion to have the same armor quality, but if the forgers can take the plate thickness or the castings can be made, there's nothing in a post-World War II vehicle which would not really be beyond the comprehension of a World War I vehicle engineer. However, if you're going to be reasonable about this very unreasonable question, sending Panthers or Pershings back in time probably isn't the best move. You want to be looking at light armor, something like an M3 half-track. So the Kegress track system is close enough both in concept and time that it's sustainable. In fact, my initial thought upon reading this question was something akin to BRDM 2s. Not battle tanks, no, but light enough, mobile enough, especially with the belly wheels, reasonably non-complicated, rugged and reliable. Of course, really what you want to do is you're going to send one vehicle back, send the pattern of the CCKW, but it's not armored. Kazuki K. Barring turbines, tank engines have typically used V layouts or inlines. Has anybody tried a boxer or flat V in a tank? It seems like that might reduce the height of the tank quite a bit. There don't seem to have been many concerns about height, even when the inlines tend to mount the cylinders completely vertically. Now, I did pull down my copy of Jane's Armor and Artillery Upgrades, and I went through the engine section, front to back, every single country. It's a 2008 copy, but it's the best I have. Not a single piston engine was listed that wasn't an inline or a V. Now, that's not to say they were never tried. The Chieftain's L60, of course, is an opposed piston, for however good that was. The other obvious case in point is the flat 12 used by the EBR, which is pretty much directly under the crew compartment because of the sort of push me pull you nature of the vehicle. However, there is a big asterisk here, and that's from Cummins. Last year, they were awarded a contract with Akatis to develop a new opposed piston engine. It's called the Advanced Combat Engine. They say it's good for between 750 to 1,500 horsepower. We'll see where that goes. Also, drawing on my experience from Iraq, where would you place the average engagement distance you were involved in? As a consequence, would you say tank design is beginning to draw similar conclusions to small arms design in the recognition that most actual combat does not, in fact, take place over extremely long distances? Would there be an advantage in reducing gun length in order to redistribute the weight to somewhere else on the tank or other capabilities? Now, I don't personally recall ever shooting at over 500 yards or so, but I didn't exactly engage in open warfare. It was a counterinsurgency. However, I think there is no reason to reduce it. The tank provides a firepower capability which is absolutely not being met by anything else on the battlefield. If your rifle is too short-ranged, somebody in the squad is going to have a DMR rifle, for example, designated marksman's rifle. Which means that I just said something like ATM machine. Please forgive me. So, for heavy weapons, the tank is the DMR, the IFV is the rifle. Secondly, as long as barrel length allows for increased penetration for a particular caliber, the longer you can get away with, the better. Caleb Engelhardt. Why didn't the US put serious stock in the medium tank in the interwar period, and why did the M1921, 1922, and T1 medium tanks fail? Well, for that I would direct you to my US Doctrine Talks. The group most interested in maneuver capabilities was Chaffee's Mechanized Cavalry, and they wanted light tanks. The infantry weren't worried about particularly fast tanks, but when the money did start coming available for new tanks in the late 1930s after the M2 light, it was the medium tank which was supported, not the light tank. As for the 1921 and 1922, they frankly just didn't work. The T1, sort of a modified 1926, uh, did work at least well enough to be recommended for standardization as the M1, but it didn't go anywhere, both figuratively, uh, possibly just due to lack of funds, and literally, as it wasn't particularly fast at 12 miles an hour, at least until re-engining a few years later. Pratt, why didn't the US use a gun shield on the M3 half-tracks? 
I never thought about it, but the man's right. One would think that they might have looked at the machine gun gun shield on the German half-tracks and thought, you know, that's not a bad idea. Now, the old rail mount on the half-tracks was replaced with a circular skate mount in mid-1942. And when they did that, thus creating the M3A1 and M2A1, they also put a protective sheet of armor around the ring, thus better protecting the gunner. But they did not put an actual shield on the gun itself. I can only think of three possibilities as to why, all of which have been proven since not to be massively major issues since gun shields were eventually added onto caliber 50s, such as, for example, on the M113A cabs. Firstly, they wanted to keep the gunner's field of vision as open as possible instead of focus down whatever direction the gun was aiming at that particular moment. Secondly, they were trying to keep the weight down. Thirdly, uh, the caliber 50 and ammo box were so big uh, that maybe they figured enough the guy's head was protected anyway. So, I mean, you shoot an MG42 from the side. So you're standing up and you're above the height of the gun barrel. But with the caliber 50, you get down behind it. So I suspect that's really the real reason. You have to stand a fair bit higher in than the vehicle armor itself to shoot an MG42 than you do a caliber 50. I did a quick bit of hunting around. Uh, and I couldn't actually find any caliber 50 gun shield photos on a half track. Not to say it never happened, and I have been doing this job long enough never to say it never happened, uh, but it just doesn't seem to have been much of a thing. Make of that what you will. Felicity Longus, the appearance of IS-3, is considered to be the shock that created the development of the heavy tanks M103 and Conqueror. However, at the time, the US was working on the T-29 series and T-32 heavy tanks. If IS-3 was such a concern, why didn't the US just immediately put into service the vehicles which had in fact already been created? I guess mainly because they just weren't up to par. The one best suited to enter immediate production was the T-32, based on Pershing, and the test reports were fairly positive. I've gone over it before. However, on the other hand, it wasn't that much of an improvement over the in-service M26 to warrant introduction into service. The bigger tanks, the T29 series, were originally going to be powered by the 4GAC, the V12 engine uh, variant of the Sherman's GAA, 790 horsepower. So we have a basically new engine in a vehicle which was not tested. The tank quite simply was not ready for production. Also, the Cold War didn't exactly turn hot the day after the Berlin Parade, although there were certainly concerns that one may come up. There was simply no huge impetus to place these tanks immediately into service. It seemed that it would be possible to take the time to create a better weapon a little bit later, and so the T-29 series turned into test beds for engines, transmissions, and even fire control systems. Also, one of the proposed heavy tank models from the Question Mark Conference was to use a massive 175mm gun in a turret with an equally gigantic 108-inch turret ring. Are there any other examples of gun tanks of such a scale? Rat? Interesting, it's worth observing that for the purposes of testing, some 108-inch turrets were built, at least three designed by Detroit Arsenal and manufactured by Union Steel Castings. However, the goal here wasn't so much to have a big gun, but actually to test a theory of turret design. The line of thinking was that it would permit better resistance to fire than the more narrow turret of T-43, which shows, of course, the M103 prototype. For the testing, they plunked one on top of an M-43 hull, and you can see just how much wider the hull, uh, correction, wider than the hull, the turret ring is. After shooting at two of them, uh, plus a T-43 turret for comparison, the end conclusion was that it was just as capable from the front, but provided better protection from attacks at 30 degree angles from the front. The conclusion was that the design principles, uh, which in fairness they're not too far from the IS-3 design, should be used in future tank designs. Of course, the problem is that if you keep the shape but make the ring smaller, you end up with a cramped design like IS-3. So, oh well. Commissar Carl. I recall reading somewhere that as a rule of thumb, 
a plate of rolled steel armor will do better than cast armor on the same basis. However, from Pershing until M1, cast became the method of choice. What did the US Army know about cast versus rolled armor? It may be that on a direct equivalence basis, rolled is better. I don't know, I've seen arguments and I just can't remember what it was, the final answer offline. Uh, however, cast armor does have other advantages. For starters, it's a lot easier to make, at least once you have the large casting process figured out. Secondly, it's more space efficient, so it's very easy to change thickness on the various parts of cast armor to reflect the level of vulnerability that you know, that armor has as it changes its shape. And because you don't need corners, the amount of volume to be protected can be more efficiently created. Only with the development of later composite armor types, which can't really be cast, did the default go back to welded plate construction. Alexander H, do you know any details on the use of scorpions and scimitars in the Falklands War? Honestly, I've not really looked into it. They sent nine CVRTs, four each scorpion and scimitar, and one each Samson recovery vehicle, transported aboard a motor vessel Elk as far as Ascension, and then it was transferred to Fearless, from where they were then transferred to shore by LCUs. Obviously, they were not really being used in their reconnaissance role, and instead were used in combat as light tanks in an infantry support role. They first acted as beachhead perimeter security. They were also used, believe it or not, as transports and tugs. Remember, the infantry were walking, especially once you have the loss of the heavy lift helicopters. Although there were a couple of Supercats and BV-206s around, anything capable of hauling personnel or equipment around the soft terrain of the Falklands was worth its weight in gold. One Scorpion troop fired in support of tree power on Mount Longdon. Uh, they later did a little bit of scouting for the Scots Guards before lobbing a few rounds from the flank as a diversion for their attack. The whole lot of them, all eight vehicles, were brought together to support two para at Wireless Ridge and 2nd Battalion Scots Guards at Tumbledown. Beyond that though, I've not really looked for anything. Sim Crawford. With everyone and their donkey seemingly looking to bag a shiny new IFV, AFV from Boxer to whatever Norinko calls their weasel looking thing, what is your pick of the bunch? Are you talking about Sharp Claw or the ZLC 2000? I don't have one, honestly. I'm sure they're all great vehicles which meet the design roles fantastically. However, when asked to assess them, I suffer from two particular problems. Firstly, I don't have a role for one other than to sit in my garage and look awesome when I take it out and about, which is what the M3 Scout car is going to be for. Secondly, I've not as much as seen, let alone used, many of these vehicles. If it was as easy as pontificating on the internet, there wouldn't be any need for months-long field trials with the troops. And frankly, I wish other internet commentators would stop saying this is the best vehicle because, mainly because I strongly doubt many of them are involved in field trials. On occasion, one or two people who were involved will chime in, such as Stefan over at the Swedish Tank Museum, who was part of the Leopard 2 crew on the trials against the M1. But even at that, his perspective is from Swedish needs and those specific variants of the tanks. However, you did ask if I could come up one, with one for cool factor, ignoring all rational arguments, which is entirely subjective. I've always liked the Japanese vehicles, so if I'm going to be commuting around the roads here in San Antonio, the Type 16 MCV seems to look the part. As far as I know, it's also a reasonably good vehicle. Minion, what are the five standout tanks for their time in regards to crew comfort, ergonomics, etc.? I've made frequent references for somewhere to sleep, but what else is equally important? The ferret scout car doesn't count because you looked way too comfortable in it. Well, it was comfortable. So it's elbow room, creature comforts, and ease of maintenance. The US even conducted what was called ease of maintenance tests on new vehicles. After all, as the British observed in Dracula, if you're spending time maintaining the vehicle, you're not sleeping. Centurion needs to get a nod for shoe. It had elbow room, it had a drinking water tank, and it had a boiling vessel. That's good right out the gate. Merkava's back hatch probably deserves a mention, because it's terrible to climb down from the tank only to realize, oh, damn it, I left my notebook by the TC's control handle. And it must be very nice to just open the door and walk in. That said, upon asking a former Merkava commander, 
His head, he just climbed up as often as not. So, I don't know. Maybe it's just me getting older. It may be cheating a bit, but the Mark IV as a tank which could be driven by just one man instead of four. If you want elbow room, I'm gathering that the M60 takes the prize. Now, anyone I know who has tried the M1 and any other tank like Leopard have all remarked as to how comfortable the M1 is. But dino tankers who converted to the M1 have all said that they missed the space on the M60's turret, where you could actually set up a hammock inside the turret. Finally, on the maintenance aspect, the M18 with its slide out engine and transmission probably saved no end of time for the mechanics and was, as far as I know, the first to have that feature. Iron FE. Have you ever had a time when your main gun on your tank has failed to go boom? And what is the procedure to clear said failure? Now, I could have sworn I have covered misfire drills before, but just in case I hadn't, here it is. Now that I think about it, I probably need to put some sort of a collated page somewhere where I can list all of the previous Q&A questions. So maybe I can put a link to that page or something on a Google document. I'll, I'll have a chew on this before the next Q&A. Anyway, so here we go. You yell fire, pull trigger, nothing happens. You yell misfire. Maybe the commander can have a go with his override handle, but more normally you're just going to go straight to the master blaster, which is a hand crank. It generates an electric current. If that doesn't work, the breach needs to be reseated to ensure that it's in the correct position and the firing pin lines up with the primer. So to do that, you crank the breach operating handle part way and then just let the breach slam shut. Repeat the steps as before. If it still doesn't work, consider the possibility of a hang fire. Uh, but if you can't wait, open the breach, rotate around 180 degrees and ram it back in. Repeat the earlier steps. If that still does nothing, stow the round and try a different round. It's more likely going to be the round than the system. Not least, one of the tests you do is a firing circuit test. And it's an incredibly simple way of checking that there's electricity running through the firing pin. And what you have is a tester, which is a wooden board with a simple printed circuit on it. At the top of the board is a light bulb. Insert it behind the breech. When you pull the trigger, if the light goes on, you have a good circuit through the firing pin. The closest I've personally come to a main gun failure was a stuck round. After firing a few shots, there seemed to have been enough residue that when we were returning to base and wanted to unload the gun, opening the breech extracted the aft cap, but the rest of the round and propellant was stuck in the gun. Fortunately, the loader caught it before we had propellant spread around the turret floor. So we kicked it back in and we fired it off a few days later. This incidentally is one reason why the common argument about autoloaders being inferior because you can't change range is not only mechanically incorrect, because some autoloaders can, but incorrect in practice as well. Normally, once a round is in the tube, you probably want to leave it there until you shoot it. John Rayburger, do tanks have a design goal for the length of time that the crew is expected to stay continuously in the tank? I would think so, because all vehicles need maintenance. Does this vary by country? I don't know if it's a goal per se, but one of the tests in a typical evaluation is a 24-hour NPC lockdown. The thinking is that unless things have gone to the stage that there is no point in living anymore, decontamination should be available within about 24 hours. Either that, or the testing agencies just don't want to subject their testing agents to the misery for more than 24 hours, and they can then take a rest and move on to the next evaluation test. This was the one test that Stefan mentioned, the F1 beat the pants off of the Leopard. NBC, um, okay, shows my age, it's Seaburn these days, is I think the only instance where staying in the tank would be absolutely enforced. John Kettner, if I could own and drive any tank ever built, which would be your favorite? Well, if I had the budget for the fuel bill and spare parts and the hangar to park it in, and I don't care about infrastructure concerns, the M1A1, purely out of nostalgia. I realized that the base A1 I had in Iraq and even the aims I converted to are all now gate guards or in storage, but I have an affinity for it. Plus it's cool looking, it makes a lovely noise and it's plenty fast enough for commuting purposes. The Slavin uh, tells me I'm apparently getting the pronunciation wrong, uh, but he's not telling me how it actually is pronounced. Slavin, Slavin? Was the M2 medium ever used in battle? No, not to my knowledge. 
I have a very vague recollection of two or four M2s being sent to Egypt for the British and that they were used as tracing ta training tanks. But even at that, I can't recall if they were M2 mediums or M2 lights, and I can't find the photograph offhand to check. So I'm sure somebody will chime in below. USA, USA. What did the CO and his exec of a World War II independent tank battalion do once his subordinate units being parceled out to the regiments that they were supposed to support? It seems like a waste of two perfectly good tanks sitting around doing nothing. Well, they hung around division headquarters mainly, unless an operation was coming which required the use of more than one company. They would be the subject matter experts and advisors to division as to how best to use the tanks. So, yes, the crews and tanks would be hanging around twiddling the thumbs, unless they were either rotated to the front to fill in for battle damage or lost personnel, or a large operation cropped up which required the use of the battalion staff tanks. Interestingly, a similar problem would happen to the company commanders who would split their platoons off. They often would park their tank by the infantry regiment's command post and play radio relay, as the tank radios could not talk to the infantry radios. This is the days before someone in late 1944 came up with the idea of wiring a field telephone to the back of the tank. If an infantry unit wanted to tell the tank something, they would radio up the line to the regimental command tent, who would then yell over to the guy sitting on the tank, who would then relay back down to the tank platoon. Very inefficient, although later they started using jeeps for the role and eventually they figured out local communications. Flipped Sherman. Living up to my namesake as an overturned M4A376 HVSS, I have to ask, what was the most bizarre or destructive armored vehicle driving mishap I have personally witnessed? The destruction by fire of an M1A1 under tow from another M1A1. Now, if you are towing a tank, you are supposed to have an exhaust deflector installed. Well, we didn't have any. We had them on order, on request, but we obviously were not going to hold the war pending their arrival. One of the other platoons in the company had had a tank breakdown and was towing the tank elephant style back to base. A little outside the base perimeter and thus in full view of cameras, the heat from the exhaust of the towing tank satellites something inside the tank behind, which eventually went into full burn, ammo exploding, all that sort of good stuff. The road wheels just melted. The exhaust deflector showed up the next week. The most potentially destructive incident was to do with an MRAP, and I believe it was a Max Pro Dash. So at this point, I'm sitting in the Squadron 3 shop, so I don't see the vehicle, just the pictures brought back for the staff meetings. The vehicle had basically fallen 100 feet down a cliffside in Afghanistan near a town entrance, and we were trying to figure out what to do with it. Attempts to crane the thing up had failed. I should add, this wasn't our truck, it happened during our left seat, right seat changeover from the previous unit. Anyway, the CO decides it's probably best to simply blow the thing in place and destroy it that way. Maybe pull up the pieces bit by piece if we have to. So we're on a small base. The closest thing we have to an engineer unit which knows explosives is EOD. So we call EOD in and we explain the problem. They say they have a chew on it and report back that evening. That evening, I am present for the brief back to the CO. They start off by saying, Okay, there is nothing in the manuals about this sort of thing, and we're not sure just how much explosives it will take to blow it up. Not a great start. So, Does anybody remember the video of the road construction crew in Oregon who weren't quite sure how much explosives it would take to destroy a beached whale? They continued. However, we have talked to the artillery folks on the base, and they have given us 15 rounds of 155mm to put into the truck. We think that ought to be sufficient to do the job. CO's jaw just drops. Do the job on the truck or on the town at the top of the cliff? Denied. If I recall, they eventually went with uh, linear shaped charges. And apparently they didn't do a great job because we encountered an IED made with an air cylinder from that truck a month or two later. Chris Hewitt. Was Tom Clancy's Red Storm Rising more or less correct in his assumptions of how the potential conflict would play out? Would there really have been the time and space to put Reforger into action and have a massive counterattack to cut off the advancing hordes? Or would it have been more likely that tactical nuclear warheads would have been used at potential choke points? RSR was based around a game of harpoon. The chapter Dance of the Vampires was in effect played out using a miniatures game. 
which I have actually. Now I think about it. Oh, that's command decision. Command at C. Oh, we've got a harpoon here somewhere. Expansion, South Atlantic War. Oh, here we go. Harpoon 4. There is a Harpoon 5 that just came out, which one day I'm going to actually have to get around to. Anyway, it seems that once they played out the scenario, Clancy decided it was possible to make a, a, a write-up dramatically. And then he came out with the entire World War III novel to fit around it. So with Harpoon at the core of the novel, I guess it makes sense that the battle for the shipping lanes would take center stage in the plot. Now, as for how much of an effect Reforger would have had in real life, I suspect that part of it was planning for it simply because there was no viable alternative, because you know, not planning for it just means you won't get nuked. Uh, and part of it was also the ideal of reinforcing Europe as tensions ratcheted up, but before the shooting started. Remember, you're talking about a week just to get a ship across the ocean, let alone adding time for loading, unloading, marshalling, transport from the army base to the port, and then getting from the port to the battlefield. Although the battlefield may well be much closer to the port by that point than it was when the reforger exercise started. So two to three weeks is probably more like reality. If the steamroller hasn't steamrolled by then, going nuclear may well have been an option for the Soviet side. And if it was actually steamrolling, well, it may well have been an option for NATO. A somewhat better book overall for that sort of scenario, albeit written in 1978, was The Third World War by General Sir John Hackett and others, written as a sort of a history book written in the future. It was updated again, if I recall, about 1984. Now, of course, the realism of that book is also open to question, especially given the extent of the nuclear exchange. Not that I think many people would miss Birmingham. And, spoiler alert. Uh, there is also an online sort of equivalent called World War Three 1987. So, yeah, www3 1987.com, something like that. I haven't read it yet, but I hear it is worth the time. Nachtel Firakesi. What kind of terrain would you choose to fight on as an attacker or a defender and why? Does it depend on the size of the unit you are commanding? I've often struggled with this one, as a stereotypical terrain brief in an operations order will open with the terrain favours the defence, or the terrain favours the attack. As near as I can tell, this is purely something to be considered at the large unit level, as it reflects the level of canalisation and manoeuvre. If the attacker has little choice as to where he can go, then that makes the job of the defender much easier, as he only has to worry about one or two places. If the attacker has a broad variety of choices as to where to go, or if he has room to spread out and attack with most of its force online at the same time, then that favours the attack. However, when it comes to the topography of the battlefield itself, it seems to be more down to the weapon systems being used than attack defence considerations. I think so. I mean, if you're attacking, and you have a mechanised force with accurate, long-range capability of tank cannons and missiles, and good, responsive artillery, you're probably going to want lots of long open spaces. But if you're defending and you have the same equipment, you're going to want to want lots of long open spaces. On the other hand, if your weapons are better suited for short range fires, you're going to want rolling terrain and trees either on the attack or on the defense. Similarly, if your force ratio is much smaller than the enemy's, You'll want broken terrain so that you can concentrate your fires whilst allowing the enemy to use only a portion of his own forces against you. Again, if you're in the attack or on the defense. Bottom line, terrain is neutral, and what sort of terrain you will want probably depends on who you are, not what you're doing. Rad W. What was the first tank or armored fighting vehicle to have air conditioning for the crew? Honestly, I don't know. I have heard someone say that one of the problems is finding room for the system in the vehicle, which seems a little bit daft. I mean, if you can fit one in a smart car. I've heard someone else say that it's an unnecessary drain on power, which you would kind of believe if it weren't for the MPC systems, which I'm sure take about as much power. And if you're in a position where you need the MPC system going, I guess you can live without the aircon. Besides, I recall that when we started operating in Iraq, all of a sudden, red dot air conditioners started sprouting on Humvees. 
and then we received an M1114, which had aircon built into it from the beginning. So obviously those problems weren't actually real problems. As near as I can tell, the main reason air conditioning was never made a standard feature on armored vehicles, even after it became common in cars, was that somebody decided it was cheaper just to get the troops to drink water. I recall the debacle when the UH-72 Lakota was being tested. They sent some to Fort Irwin. A riles later, I was reading in the newspaper that aircon was going to be added to the aircraft at the customer's expense, which implies that Eurocopter had told them that they needed aircon for the electronics. The army said, no, it's unnecessary weight and expense. And then the army were proven wrong. Now, I have not read an official assessment of this, but that's my interpretation of the data. I wouldn't be surprised if it turned out that the first air-conditioned AFV was by some customer requirement from Singapore, for example, uh, which was added to an already excellent vehicle as like an option. By and large, it seems that such systems didn't really start getting fielded in any large numbers until the 1990s. Make of it what you will. But if somebody comes up with an actual answer, please post it down below. Robert Dendoven, if you could take a time machine back to the summer of 1942 and could influence ordnance in only one type of tank improvement to the follow-up tanks of the M4, would it be the engine, transmission, gun, or ammunition type? What is it with the time travel questions this time? Well, the question says a follow-up, but in reality, barring T23, there isn't a follow-up tank yet. T26 hadn't even been thought up by that point. So my answer is ammunition, build HVAP. It's a very simple change, well within the realm of practicality for the industry at the time. Engine and transmission changes were already being trialed, and the gun was about as good as you could get in a Sherman. Now, I have a vague recollection that I've attacked that question before as well, so another argument for that compiled list. Van Owen, I was reading in can openers, thank you, how the three inch GMC T57 required the entire back of the vehicle to be jacked up and then lowered over and over again in order to adjust the track tension. Whilst this was a test vehicle that probably would not have made it to the field, is there any track tensioning system that did make it into production models that was particularly egregious? A uh, reminder for the ignorant cat openers is my book on tank destroy development. I can't think of any. Anything that heinous probably would not have made it past the testing phase. Of course, it also depends on your frame of reference. If you are used to just pushing a lever like a British tanky, you might consider the American system to be egregious. And using a massive wrench like on a Sherman would be absolutely barbaric. Also, he asks, when transporting AFVs via ship, what's the process to prepare them for travel? Kind of depends on your era, I guess. If you're sending an M1 on a modern military seat of command ship, I don't think there's any particular preparation required at all. Back in World War II, it required specific greasing and sealing. This was not done by the crews, or even undone by the crews. Dewaterproofing tanks in France was supposedly to be done at the ports after arrival. Occasionally, a few tanks did make it to line units where they broke down after a few miles of use, which led to investigations and then lastly telegrams being sent back up the line. B7. Were there any attempts to repurpose flame tanks or agricultural or other peaceful applications? I am unaware of any attempts to utilize the philosophy of a kill it with fire on a military scale in the civilian environment. Any civilian use of such things likely would not require the use of an armored vehicle. Of course, one could always observe the use of M60 tanks for avalanche control, but that was indeed a bit of an oddity. Most places just use towed howitzers instead of an armored vehicle. And I believe even Washington no longer uses the M60s. Jamie McMillan, what were little machine guns on the backs of the Soviet tanks for? It stands to reason that since they persisted across so many tanks, they must have been deemed important. But seeing as how no other nation appears to have opted to make an already cramped turret even more cramped by sticking a machine gun pointing the wrong way into it, were they of any use? Well, it wasn't just the Russians. There is always the American cult of the machine gun, which ended up with porcupines like the M2 Medium. Uh, but there were others as well, notably the Japanese. The Japanese, at least, well, they really appreciated the flexibility of a ball mount. Uh, they realized that you couldn't really have room for both a ball mount with a good range of motion and a proper gun in a constrained front of a tank turret. Yes, I know, the 38T had one, 
but what was the actual arc of fire of that machine gun? It basically makes the front plate larger than it needs to be if you were to do it. So they just put the ball mount in the back, or on some designs even the side of the tank. If they felt they were more likely to need the machine gun, they would turn the turret, bringing the machine gun into the arc of fire as they advanced. I got the suspicion that the multiply accursed MTLS had a similar concept, although not quite as much rotating was required for its ball mounts. There was also the little rear turret, uh, machine gun turret on the T1 heavy tank. Uh, the practical utility of that, I am not so sure about. For the Russians, though, it seems to simply be a case of being able to shoot in either direction quickly or at will. Uh, for a KV, which is just going to wade into the battle line, that actually makes a little bit of sense. It may seem to make a little bit less sense for something like a BT, until you look at one of their proposed methods of use, which is basically charging right through the battle line to the far side and then into, into the depths. Reich's beer minister. What are my top three moments of, God damn it, haven't those Muppets learned anything? in tank design from 1936 on. Not including lunatics that demanded 188 ton tanks and without the benefit of hindsight. I'm tempted to start with TOG. Uh, that said, much though it proved to be a total waste of effort and entirely unsuited to the modern combat as it turned out, it did actually meet its intended design goals pretty well. Building a prototype which ended up being overtaken by events was certainly not unique to TOG. The American T-28 Super Heavy would be another case of building a vehicle for positional warfare. Char B-1 goes in there for being just an absolutely archaic and inefficient design. Uh, finally, my perennial favourite, the lack of optics for the gunner on German tanks. I've said it before and I don't know what they were thinking. Robert Nabaroni, how to differentiate an SE-152 from an ISU-152? Well, since the SU was based on the KV and the ISU was based on the IS, there's your answer. But since the IS was basically based on a KV, it is not surprising that the two are fairly similar. Your main visual differentiations are going to be the running gear size, shape of the superstructure, and the engine deck slash rear plate. The ISU suspension is overall lower the track return being a good few inches closer to the ground. The wheels, especially the sprocket, are a fair bit smaller. As the return run is lower, that means that there is more height available for the superstructure. So if you look at the sides, you'll see that there is much more surface area to the superstructure side on the ISU. The angle of the front corner plates is less harsh on the ISU as well. If you look at the engine deck, the SU has a short horizontal section leading to a gentle slope about halfway back, while the ISU is a much longer flat section than a much sharper slope at the tail. There are, of course, multiple other differences, but if you're looking at a grainy photograph, that's probably a good start. He actually asked four questions. Second, when I was on active duty, there were rumors that the Soviets had a T-62-based assault gun with 130mm gun. Any truth to that, or was it vaporware? I can't think of any truth to it. There were some experiments with 130mm on tanks, such as IS-7 and Object 279. I cannot find a reference to anything on a T-62 chassis. There was an SPG conversion of a T-55 in Iraq, a one-off, uh, but again, not an assault gun per se. Third, is there a master list of my videos so we can chase them all down? No, but the vast majority are either on this channel or on the World of Tanks North America channel. Fortunately, they have a playlist called All Things Chieftain. I have cropped up on two Forgotten Weapons videos, one on the Boss Garage, a couple on Military History Visualized, and one each on the We Have Ways podcast and Cold Star Project. Uh, there are also some appearances over on the World of Warships channel, mainly in the Naval Legends and Naval Fortresses series. And finally, could the US have produced a 90mm Yeg Sherman? Sure, why would it need to? It was producing the M36 on the Sherman hull, and it seemed to be doing fine. Lorenzo Schiaccia. Schiaccia? Sorry. I mentioned the AS-42 Sahariana as the nemesis of the LRDG. Was it better suited than the Chevrolets and Jeeps used by the British? And are there any surviving Saharianas? I probably should have said counterpart more than nemesis, but anyway. 
Not having seen any test reports comparing the two, it is an educated guess, but it seems to me that the Sahariana was closer to a purpose-built vehicle, with some big wheels to help with operating on rough or soft ground. Plus it was designed with a huge radius of action in mind, and as far as I know it seemed reliable. Thus, at first glance, yes, it does seem to have been very well suited to task. No, I am unaware of any which survived to this day. Red-headed Stepesum also has two. Why couldn't they make a 76mm with a larger HE payload, and thus make it as effective as a 75mm? In theory they could, but it would come with its own problems. As the 76mm had greater force and also faster spin as a result, the walls of the shell needed to be thicker in order to keep the whole thing together. The solution to that problem is a low velocity shell. Such things can be made easily enough, you basically put less powder into it. The 17 pounder eventually had one developed, for example, by the end of the war. However, at least two additional problems may follow as a result. Firstly, the trajectory is going to be heinously different, which may add complications to the reticle and super elevation calculation, especially in the heat of battle. Secondly, with less force imparted to the shell, that also means less recoil being imparted the other direction to operate the breech mechanism. This was a problem discovered with the World War II era 90mm HVAP mounted on the M26. The mass of the projectile was sufficiently low that after the round was fired the breech would have to be manually opened and the casing extracted because there wasn't enough force acting on a mechanism to push the system the full length of the recoil lung. I presume it was fixed in later round designs. Secondly, he says he's always liked the AMX 10RC as a cavalry vehicle because of the 105. When the 105mm armed MPF enters a service for the US, would it make a useful replacement for the Bradley for cavalry use? No. For starters, there are no dismounts. US cavalry doctrine requires the presence of troops. Secondly, why bring along an under-armored tank with a 105mm gun when you can bring along a heavily armored tank with a 120mm gun? US armored cavalry units have had tanks back in their orbats for a couple of years now. K. Hey Grant, would you please do a history of the jerry can? I don't really need to. The curator of the Tank Museum has already done a reasonably thorough video on the subject. Do a search on YouTube for the Tank Museum jerry can, two words. You'll get a 20 minute answer. Robert Olweiler. Near the end of the Cold War, the late 1980s, my dad was in the US Army Reserves as a tanker. If things were to heat up, he was to be sent right to Germany in an M60 A3. TTS. What would be one, his chances of getting back, and two, if not, what would be the th top things most likely to get him? Of course, back in the day, the guard got the hand me downs from the regular army. Actually, the army reserves had tanks at the time as well. This policy started to change after the war on terror got going, and new equipment coming down the line would start to be fielded to whatever unit was currently available to accept it, be it National Guard or active duty, which is why some guard units ended up with A2s. Uh, but in the 1980s, not so much. The saving grace is that by the time the guard got to their M60s and then got onto the ships and onwards, most likely after the merchant navy had done a couple of runs of active duty units, the war would either have been over or the destruction would have been so thorough that the opposition would be down to T55s and other holdovers taken out of deep storage, which the TTS would be quite capable of dealing with. The TTS imager was also better than that of the early M1s, at least by reputation. So I would say there would probably be quite a good chance of his coming back if he didn't get nuked. If something was going to get him, I'd say from most to least likely, artillery, ATGM, a tank, chemicals, artillery. Tim Dalrymple. I saw the collab you did with Rich from the Boss Garage. What other content creators would you like to do a collab with? Also, would you take another look at the thing when he brings it to a Kino? Yes, I do plan on seeing it at a Kino. As for other content creators, I'm not sure. I found a very good fit with Ian. He's a non-dramatic subject matter expert. He mixes reasoned description with a little bit of humor, and I do hope that we can do more. As for others, I am sure I can find some excuse to have some fun with Drakinafel. The terrible Teutonic twins of Christoph and Bernhard are always worth a chat. If I'm ever in the same place as the History Club, we sort of make contact, but he lives in a part of the country which is quite cold, and so that's on a long-term pause. Same with Maximus, actually. 
Come to think of it, Angry Cops is also in a cold neck of the woods. Although he's close enough to Toronto, he might maybe be persuaded to come to Aquino. I don't know if his style matches with mine in any way, shape or form, and in fact it's probably as diametrically opposed as it's possible to be, but he strikes me as being a fun time. I guess the Holy Grail, such as it is, is James May. He's quite fond of tanks. I am not sure what sort of a crossover we would do though, but I would love to find out. Michael Danesk. In air combat, there are basic rules which have held true since World War I and World War II. Are there basic rules of armored combat that have remained unchanged ever since? Well, that's a very good question. And I also have to say, I have absolutely no idea what the air combat rules are. But if I had to pick some basic principles of tanking, which have remained absolutely the same for decades, no matter the technology level, I will go with these. One, tanks go as the waters flow. They stay in low ground wherever possible. You go around hills instead of cresting over the top of them. The second part of that rule is, but tanks don't drive where the tall grasses grow, as that tends to mean marsh or lake shores or the like. Two, scan, scan, scan. What you don't see can and will kill you. So burn out those turret motors and keep your head out. I realize that this last instruction of keeping your head out is not universal across all doctrines, but I do think it is correct. Three, the horse, the saddle, the man. Don't skimp on keeping your mount in good condition. Look after your vehicle, look after your equipment and stores, and only then look after yourself. As a general rule, if you have to choose between maintenance and sleep, get that track tensioned before you get in the sleeping bag. Sworn brother of the Ballistic Order of St. John Moses Browning. I was watching one of military history visualized vis videos. Good Lord, that's a tongue twister. I was watching one of military history visualized videos recently, and he made mention of a very small number of domestically designed Spanish tanks being active during the Civil War. We commonly think of the first tier powers developing their own tanks, but apart from Czechoslovakia with the 38T et al, I've never really heard of lower tier countries coming up with their own. Are there any notable examples of second or third world countries that weren't the major powers in World War II producing a homegrown tank, even in small numbers, rather than buying something off of whoever they were allied with? If so, were any of them quite good? Well, quite a lot. I mean, it wasn't as if they were second world, but Sweden and Australia both had cracks at it. Sweden, of course, having many cracks and the Aussies with Sentinel. Next door, the Kiwis had Bob Semple. Uh, you got the, the Marisal uh, from Romania, Turan from Hungary, although Turan was kind of Swedish based. Uh, Argentina had the Nahuel DL43, or however you pronounce that. Brazil also made quite the industry, particularly the Cold War, that post war, uh, of homegrown armor, at least until they went bust. South Africa, in the post-war period, also went its own way entirely, although there was certainly a French influence as well as keeping the centurions. Switzerland also had a crack at building some of its own stuff before finally going German. The Canadian, and they still of course have uh, Moag building Piranha's labs. The Canadians are an asterisk, RAM being its own design, but also based on the American vehicle. And that's sort of the lead in to modifications of other vehicles, such as the Belgian T-13, which is in effect a modified Carbon Lloyd. As for if any of them are any good, well, the Swedish stuff was certainly good. The later Brazilian or South African gear certainly also has merit. I don't know if anyone has ever done an assessment of the Nahuel. Matt Lesich, how would you rate the quality of Australian armored forces in World War II and today? What are some of the constraints that the Aussies had to deal with when they field tanks which are unique to their circumstances? I know for a fact that there are better qualified people to answer this question watching this than I am, but I'll have a crack anyway. Aussie armored forces at the beginning of the warplane didn't exist. There was a call to make them, but in the end, none were sent to North Africa. As a result, the Australian armored forces which were present, such as they did exist, were headlined by captured Italian tanks, M11s and M13s, which are not going to set you off on your best foot. When they did start getting tanks, Grants and Matildas, they weren't used in mobile warfare as much as for infantry support, often in restricted terrain, i.e. the jungles. And again, the same thing happened with the Centurions in Vietnam. 
This means that for all the Australian Armoured Corps history they haven't had any particular practical experience in manoeuvre warfare, ever. Which also begs the question of function. Australia does have some pretty open spaces, fairly well suited to tanks. But realistically there's not very many countries capable of getting a mechanised force to Australia to fight. Something must have gone seriously wrong by, by that point. Now, I have not been privy to the selection process for the M1A1 when the Aussies replaced the Leopard, but the argument that commonality with the Americans was a factor does have some merit. It does seem unlikely that Australia would ever go on a major expeditionary adventure not in company with the Americans, and if somebody invades Australia the Americans are obliged to help. That said, given how many non-American assets the Aussies have, I wonder about the extent of that compatibility argument. As for quality, I remember reading an article in Armour magazine from one of the exchange officers at Puckapunyal. There's normally an American officer and an NCO on staff there at Munster, Lulworth and Gagetown last I checked. He basically said that lieutenant school in Australia was far better than the equivalent course in the US. If that's an accurate reflection, and I've absolutely no reason to believe that the Australian military isn't absolutely professional, I am sure that they are at least serviceably, uh, serviceably good. Sean Davis After watching a video by Laserpig, I was wondering if you have any idea on the origins or use of the comb, as found on Sherman's et al. Yes, it is a brake lock for shipping, I'm pretty sure I've mentioned it in the past, but I guess that didn't get much traction or my video explaining the T-34's deficiencies, I guess. I don't know why he had to make such a, a big drama out of the comb, only to come up with the final answer at the end. I don't know, maybe it's just a barnyard thing. But I will tip my hat to him that he's getting the views and he's not actually putting out any false information, as far as I know. Right, that is it for Q&A number 24, for however long that took. So as ever, I hope you found it interesting and informative. Again, always hit that subscribe, put the little bell icon, you know the drill. Everybody always tells you, but what the hell, I figure I might as well join the crowd on this event. Couldn't hurt. Right, I am off to look and see what's happened in Ukraine the last two hours. Take care.